Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking into my laptop, um, but it's not because I'm losing my mind this time, it's because it's the Five Stone Buildings webinar programme. And I'm going to be talking about, my name's Toby, and I'm going to be talking about domicile and jurisdiction disputes. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping things. You can ask questions if you want. There's um, a Q&A box at the bottom. Now you might want to ask them anonymously because this webinar is being recorded. Now it's only me being recorded, the slides and the picture of me. Uh, but if you put your name in there, I suppose your name might come up. The recordings will be available later. Uh, we'd suggest that you switch into speaker view because then you can see a bit more of me and a bit less of the people who aren't um, talking. If you do have questions, we may well run out of time to answer them, so it might make more sense for you just to email me afterwards or you can phone me up if you like. The other point to mention is in this disclaimer. And it says essentially that this isn't legal advice, it's just my views. It's not really the views of anyone else in five stone buildings, I shouldn't think. We're gonna start with domicile. Now, if you're a private client litigator, domicile is important to you. It may have already come up in your practice, but if it hasn't, and it certainly will do, it's the gateway into a 1975 Act claim. So if, you're, if, you're, um, if the dead person wasn't domiciled in England when they died, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear it. But it's also a route into validity under the Wills Act 1963, and it can affect how you're construing certain provisions of the will, where the person was domiciled at the relevant time. Um, it can also determine the validity of a marriage, uh, which of course will affect, again, provision under a 75 Act claim, for distribution in an intestacy and that sort of thing. But this isn't a concept that's restricted simply to our um, practice area. The same rules apply in a bankruptcy case or in a divorced case and in the tax context. So we're going to start where, well, with the key principles in domicile. So the, things, the three things you need to know about domicile essentially are that there's a, a domicile of origin. Everybody has a domicile of origin. Some people have a domicile of dependency, which changes from their domicile of origin. Then there's a domicile of choice. Domicile of choice is probably the main battleground. And what you need to know about that is that it can be acquired and it can be abandoned. Now we'll also look at the types of evidence you need to win these cases. And essentially, if you're a litigator, that's your job, isn't it? The first case we're going to look at is Colonel Whitney's case. Now it's a bit modern for a chancery case. It's 1869. And the House of Lords were deciding where Colonel Whitney was domiciled at the time <clears throat> his illegitimate son was born in 1844. Now, the Lord Chancellor knew in Whitney and Whitney that what he was doing was of international significance, that his judgment was going to be applied beyond merely England. He said it's of great importance that some fixed common principles should guide the courts in every country on international questions. Now, it's a fairly lofty ambition. Colonel Whitney was born in Leghorn, and Leghorn is the English, you probably all know this, but I didn't. Uh, it's the English name for uh, the Tuscan port town of Livorno. So he was born in Italy, but he was born to the Scottish consul in Italy. He's the son of the Scottish consul. So the Lord Chancellor explained the effect of that in this way. It is a settled principle that no man shall be without a domicile. And to secure this result, the law attributes to every individual, as soon as he is born, the domicile of his father, if the child is legitimate, and the domicile of his mother, if illegitimate. This has been called the domicile of origin, and it is involuntary. Now he's mentioning that it's involuntary to distinguish it there from domicile of choice and domicile of dependency, which he considered to also be a form or species of domicile of choice. But that, that's the key concept. Whenever you're starting with a domicile dispute, work out what the domicile of origin is. And this tells you how to do it. It's often, people seem to think, that it's where a person is born. It isn't. Now, when Colonel, or young Whitney, as he then was, um, was 15, his family sent him to Edinburgh. And when he was 18, he became a commissioned officer in the Guards. 
When he was 21, he succeeded to the family estate, which perhaps unsurprisingly was in Whitney in, uh, in Aberdeenshire. 10 years later, when he was 33, he married, he'd had enough of the army, so he sold his commission and he moved to London. And the Lord Chancellor explained why he did that. It seems that Whitney was a bit of a character. He said his choice of England as a residence appears to have been considerably influenced by his taste for the sports of the turf. Whitney liked horse racing. That's why we've got this fairly silly cartoon on screen. Now, Colonel Whitney was there for 32 years. And that gave rise to the question of whether or not his domicile had changed. The Lord Chancellor explained how it might have changed. He explained that domicile of choice is a conclusion or inference which the law derives from the fact of a man fixing voluntarily his sole or chief residence in a particular place with an intention of continuing to reside there for an unlimited time. Now the courts below in Whitney and Whitney had all concluded that, uh, that Colonel Whitney had not acquired a domicile of choice in, in London um, or in England. Now, the Lord Chancellor fairly clearly had some quite grave reservations about that. Um, this is a man who, who didn't, he didn't come to England for work. He wasn't chased out of Scotland for some reason. He came here because he liked English society. He liked English horse racing uh, and he was very comfortable here. He and his wife lived here. They had the son, not the son that the case was in fact concerned with. That son later died. Um, but the Lord Chancellor didn't really need to overrule the courts below on that essentially issue of fact, because Colonel Whitney's circumstances changed. In 1844, the Lord Chancellor explained, the Colonel, after having been involved for some time in pecuniary difficulties, brackets, owing chiefly to his connection with the turf, close brackets, was compelled to leave England in order to avoid his creditors. So Colonel Whitney, shipped off to France. He left behind his wife, but he broke up his house. You might think he broke up his house because his creditors were taking his furniture and paintings. But there we are. Uh, now, whilst he was in France, his wife sadly died a couple of years later in 1846, and he set up with a lady called Miss Allett. Now, he and Miss Allett had a son in 1853. Their son was born in Camberwell in England. Again, you might think, somewhat indicative that he was uh, fond of English society. Now, they were not married at the time, there was no question about that. He received some fairly, it seems, duff advice that if he married, uh, if he married um, the mother, Miss Allant, in Scotland, then his son would become legitimised and this would affect his son's ability to inherit the family estate. That, it seems, was wrong. Um, but nevertheless, it's what um, Colonel Whitney did. So he and Miss Allatt um, went to Scotland. Uh, he professed various times and in various uh, formal ways uh, that he had a continuing intention to reside in Scotland um, and that he considered himself to be domiciled in Scotland and they married in Scotland. Uh, and then Colonel Whitney, in fact, began this action. Uh, being a, a Victorian chancery case, naturally it took so long that Colonel Whitney died in the, uh, in the intervening years. Um, but he lived out the rest of his years in Scotland um, and the court was satisfied that when he broke up his house initially, when he was chased out of London by his creditors, that was him abandoning his domicile of choice and uh, Scotland revived as his domicile of origin or the alternative he, he had acquired uh, all the necessary intention um, for Scotland to, to revive um, as his domicile. The next aspect of domicile that we're going to consider is domicile of dependency. Now this comes up in a lit litigation context at least far less often um, and the principles can be stated fairly shortly. A legitimate child who is under 16, um, their domicile follows that of their father. If the child is illegitimate or if the father um, has died then the child's domicile follows that of his mother until 16. At 16 Quite often, um, the child's, uh, what had been their domicile of dependency, will become their domicile of choice, simply because they continue to live there and they don't have any uh, particular intention to go anywhere else. 
Uh, but it's not necessarily um, that way. It can revive the domicile of origin or they can acquire some other domicile of choice because at that point they have capacity to do so. Now, even less often uh, comes up uh, the situation of a, of a wife's um, domicile of dependency. Now, until the 1st of January 1974, a wife's domicile was that of her husband, which of course is not really a very satisfactory uh, position in modern society. And so that was abolished from the 1st of January 1974. Um, and on that date, a wife uh, was deemed to have as her domicile of choice that which had been her domicile of dependency. And as I say, it comes up very, very rarely, um, although in fact it did come up in a case of Raymond and Hamid, which we'll talk about right at the end in relation to jurisdiction. Now the real fights tend to be about the acquisition and abandonment of domicile of choice. The Court of Appeal have looked at that, looked at those issues three times in the last 15 years. Now, one of the most informative cases is Barlow, Clowes and Henwood, 2008. And so I put the citation up there and I've shown you some of the various jurisdictions that were uh, in action. Now, this not a private client case. This is a bankruptcy case. A petition was presented against Peter Henwood in 2005. And the court only had jurisdiction to determine or to make an order um, that he was bankrupt if, when he was served with the petition, he was uh, domiciled in England. Now, this had been um, fairly hard fought litigation in lots of different places. Um, essentially, Peter Henwood, uh, Peter Henwood's circumstances are, are fairly, fairly interesting. He uh, was born in Solihull to a father who was from Solihull and domiciled in England. So England was without any doubt his domicile of origin, but he had uh, frankly an absolutely tragic um, childhood. His father died when he was seven years old of lung cancer um, in very distressing circumstances in front of his mother. Um, his mother died when he was eight years old um, of cancer. Uh, she was only 33 at the time. And he was sent to go and live with an uncle and aunt. The uncle was a fairly unpleasant and violent man. The aunt died when he was 11. Uh, he was then um, essentially put in a boarding school where he remained uh, until he was old enough to get out. And as soon as he got out, he left England, quite understandably. Uh, it was filled with terrible memories for him and he went away. So he went to the United States. After that, he went to the Bahamas. Then he went to the Seychelles. And he was then persuaded by a solicitor who was the executor of his mother's estate to come back. Was, uh, the proper thing to do was for an Englishman to start a family and a business in England uh, and get on with life in an ordinary way. So he came back and had a go at that. It did not go well for him at all. He married, uh, no doubt, a very pleasant lady, but unfortunately for him, that pleasant lady uh, was conducting an affair with one of his closest friends throughout the entirety of their short marriage. He started a business, a little antique shop, um, it didn't do well, um, and uh, so he left again. And he left to go to the Isle of Man. Now that was in 1975. Now Peter Henwood was in the Isle of Man from 1975 until 1992. Now, what's very helpful about uh, Barlow, Clowes and Henwood is that uh, Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, now Lady Arden, summarises a huge part of Dicey into 10 um, rather pithy little sub-paragraphs. And it's a lovely little framework for, for how the law of domicile works. Uh, and we don't need to go through all, all of them, um, but have a look yourself. It's paragraph 10 of the judgment. Now you already know from Whitney um, how domicile of origin works. It's the father's domicile. But a couple of points are, are worth uh, picking out from, from Lady Justice Arden's um, summary. Roman 4, an existing domicile is presumed to continue until it is proved that a domicile has been acquired. Uh, sorry, that a new domicile has been acquired. Now that is about burden of proof. And burden of proof in these cases, time and time again, is very, very important. So it is for the person alleging that the domicile has changed to prove it. Now, Roman 8, in determining whether a person intends to reside permanently or indefinitely, the court may have regard to the motive for which residence was taken up, 
the fact that residence was not freely chosen, and the fact that residence was precarious. Now, that's why context is important. Any one of these facts that you gather in respect of your client or in respect of the propositors, if that is not your client, um, it's important to be establishing with your client what the context of that particular fact is. So you look at Whitney, for example. Whitney left London because he was hounded out by his creditors. As far as you can tell from the judgment, what he always wanted to do was get back to London, where, which had the best horse racing in the world, um, with enough money to be able to start gambling again. So in a sense, he always had the intention to be in London, you might think. Now, Arden's uh, final point, uh, when a domicile of choice is abandoned, a new domicile of choice may be acquired, but if it is not acquired, the domicile of origin revives. And that was the crucial point in Barlow, Clowes and Henwood. So in 1992, you'll remember, Peter Henwood left the Isle of Man. Now, he left the Isle of Man because he had been a financial advisor there and he had become involved in the Barlow Clowes scandal. So in the late 80s, this scandal uh, was uncovered. Essentially, it had been a massive fraud, um, depriving thousands of pensioners of their entire life savings. It was a rather tragic situation. Um, Peter Henwood uh, had been rather more than on the sidelines of it. He was found liable by the High Court in the Isle of Man uh, for £9 million in damages for having dishonestly assisted in the distribution of stolen money. Um, he appealed that to the Privy Council and he failed. So this petition that was being presented was being presented for that £9 million of pensioners' money that he had stolen. So it's sort of useful to have in mind how attractive his case was. He was trying to get away with, uh, with, with this by, by arguing that the, pen, that the, that the petition, um, the court had no jurisdiction to determine the petition uh, because he wasn't domiciled here. And where he said he was domiciled was Mauritius, which is why you have that rather colourful flag down the bottom. Now, after he left in 1992, uh, and um, Moore Blick explained why he left, uh, he now had the financial means to escape from an embarrassing and very disagreeable set of circumstances to a new life in more congenial surroundings. So what he did was he bought an extremely comfortable uh, house in the south of France and an extremely comfortable house in Mauritius. And he and his wife divided their time between them. Um, their family would come and visit, etc. They, 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 they had a very, very pleasant existence. And so the, the, the little photo that I put on the right hand side of that slide uh, is a photo, a sort of stock photo from, a, from an infinity pool in Mauritius, which if, like me, uh, you've been stuck in a box room or, uh, or a shed at the end of your garden for the last three months and have cancelled foreign holidays, uh, is really just uh, almost so tempting as to be upsetting. So, the problem that Peter Henwood had was that he could not clearly establish which one he had chosen out of France and Mauritius. So, as Lady Justice Arden said, a person does not have to have a domicile of choice. In reality, if he, Peter Henwood, did not consider that France was his home, was his domicile of choice, it is unlikely that Mauritius was. Now, what's really striking about this case is that Peter Henwood had a distinct aversion to England. He had, he'd, all of his experiences here had been absolutely terrible, and he wanted nothing at all to do with England, both on a, on a completely understandable personal level, but also um, at a, a sort of commercial level, um, you know, he didn't want to have any connection with England because if he did, uh, well, the liquidators were going to take a lot of money off him. So that's what's, that's what's striking about this case. Whatever he wanted, he did not want England. And yet England was his domicile because he was equivocal in his choice between Mauritius and France. Now that equivocation comes in in relation to abandonment as well. So on here, we have a slightly less cheery slide. This is a, a romantic um, image of some druids carrying out a human sacrifice in a wicker man. Slightly abstract, you might be thinking at this stage. But uh, it's because in the case of Schaefer, that was Anthony Schaefer, who was born in Scotland. Now, he was a barrister for a time, but after that, he was a playwright and an author. And uh, he wrote uh, the screenplay for The Wicker Man. 
hence The Wicker Man. And whilst he was filming the screenplay for The Wicker Man, he met uh, an Australian actress called Diana, uh, and he formed uh, a very sort of deep connection with her and a loving bond. And they went back to Australia. They went back to Queensland together. And he then spent decades in Queensland. They built uh, a, an incredible uh, place for themselves, which they rather understatedly called um, the castle. Uh, and um, he had in the castle, he had an enormous library and his study. He voted in Australian elections for many years. He involved himself in Australian um, culture, cultural activities. He, he, he really embraced the Australian lifestyle. And the court had really no hesitation in finding that he had acquired a domicile of choice in Australia, in Queensland. But towards the end of his life, he began to spend more and more time in London, in his studio in London. Um, initially, it seems for work, but then he formed uh, a relationship with um, with a woman in in London, uh, and the correspondence sort of indicates that it was certainly more intense than the relationship he had with Diana in Australia. Um, and he divided his time between the two, and so there was there was a question really as to whether he continued to have his his domicile. You know, his primary residence and continued to intend um, to reside indefinitely in Queensland. Now, Lord Justice Lewison explained the issue of abandonment in this way. It must be shown that the propositus has ceased to reside in the territory in which he had the domicile of choice and that the propositus has no intention to return to reside there, brackets, as opposed to an intention not to return, close brackets. The absence of intention must be unequivocal so that a person who is in two minds does not have the necessary absence of intention. In addition, the abandonment of domicile of choice is not to be lightly inferred. Now, here there's a, there's a synergy with, with Peter Henwood's case and, and it's in relation to equivocation. So the intention must be settled. It either must be settled in its presence or in its absence. So the difficulty for Peter Henwood was that he hadn't settled his future intention. Um, well, essentially, it's the same question. He hadn't set, settled his future intention about whether he was going to be in Mauritius or, uh, or, in, um, or in France. And therefore, because he had no continuing domicile of choice, his domicile of origin revived. With Anthony Schaefer, he hadn't decided whether he was going to be in Australia or in England. Uh, and so therefore, the party with the burden of proof could not establish the change. And Queensland prevailed as his domicile of choice. Now, if we move on now to the the evidence and the nature of the inquiry. The first authority that I'd mention is Drevin and Drevin. Now, you'll see that 1864, just a little before the, uh, the Whitney case. But it was said in that case, that there is no act, no circumstance in a man's life, however trivial it may be in itself, which ought to be left out of consideration in trying the question whether there was an intention to change the domicile. A trivial act might possibly be of more weight with regards to determining this question than an act which was of more importance to a man in his lifetime. Now, that really is just an invitation to you to get into the detail of your client's life. Quite often, the clients skirt over the, the nitty gritty of day to day life. What they're more interested in telling you about is their applications for citizenship and where they bought property and what they told to various tax authorities. And all that stuff is important. You certainly need to um, include it within your evidence. But often, it's not that which really decides the thing. Because a person thought it was more, more or less favorable to pay tax somewhere, it doesn't really tell you whether or not they intended to be in, in a particular place for the rest of their lives. If you're looking at whether they embraced the local culture, if they joined the local troop of Morris men, there's not any obvious advantage to them in doing so, other than the fact that they appreciated English, fairly eccentric culture. So the other authority, where, where this uh, topic is explored fairly extensively is the other Court of Appeal authority, Siganak and Agulian. Now, well, Justice Longmore said that all the cases state 
that a domicile of origin can only be replaced by clear and cogent, clear, cogent and compelling evidence that the relevant person intended to settle permanently and indefinitely in the alleged domicile of choice. Now, Siganak Magulian is a striking example of this. It involved a, a, a Mr. Nathaniel. Mr. Nathaniel was born in Northern Cyprus in 1939. He spent the first 20 years of his life in Cyprus, but then he came to London. Uh, and from 1960 until 1972, he was in London. He returned to Cyprus in 1972, but he was only there for two years because in 74, the Turks invaded uh, and effectively his part of Cyprus came under Turkish rule. Um, he fled in 1974 uh, and came back to Shepherd's Bush and he spent the rest of his life in Shepherd's Bush. He became quite a successful hotelier. Um, but he continued to involve himself in Cypriot culture, particularly Greek Cypriot culture. Now, when exploring the, 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 the way in which he lived his life and his cultural and, and, and economic connections between the two countries, it inspired Lord Justice Mummery, to put it in fairly poetic language. He said, the court must look back at the whole of the deceased's life, at what he has done with his life, at what life has done to him, and at what were his inferred intentions in order to decide whether he had acquired a domicile of choice in England by the date of his death. Soren Kiergaard's aphorism, that life must be lived forwards, but can only be understood backwards, resonates in the biographical data of domicile disputes. That's a very nice way of saying, you know, you really need to get under the bonnet of this person's life. Now, he, he, he had invested in businesses in Cyprus. He bought property in Cyprus. Um, he continued to go there, mainly in southern Cyprus, whenever he could. Um, but when he died, his, his Polish partner, his fiance, um, wanted to start a 75 Act claim. Now, of course, that meant she needed, she needed to prove uh, he was domiciled in England. And because his domicile of choice of, of origin was, was Cyprus, she needed to prove the change. So the burden was on her and she just couldn't do it. Now, one of the, one of the perhaps most important factors counting against her was that um, Mr. Nathaniel, sent his infant daughter to Cyprus. So when she was five or six, he sent her to Cyprus to be educated in Cyprus, raised in Cyprus, and to really be a Cypriot. Now that, uh, to anyone who's got um, children, well, half of the time you probably think it's an excellent idea to send them to an island several thousand miles away. But in reality, it's not something you do lightly, unless you consider yourself to be a Cypriot and you consider that you would be going back there. The last uh, of the Court of Appeal cases that I want to mention is Kelly and Pires. Kelly and Pires is, uh, is a divorce case. Um, but what's important about it is, is well, that passage there from Lady Justice King. The statements of people claiming or disputing a change must be treated with caution and less corroborated by action consistent with the declaration. The court will view evidence of an interested party with suspicion. Now, that of course is obvious obvious to anyone who's, who's done trials in front of the judge, um, that the assertions of interested parties don't carry very much weight. Now, in a, in a divorce case, usually, uh, the, the propositus is still alive, um, and the same in, in, say, a tax case. In most of our sort of private client estates work, the propositus is, is dead. Um, but it doesn't really matter who it is who is asserting that this intention existed, because um, they're all going to be interested parties. Uh, and people make these assertions for various reasons. For example, in Siganak and Agulian, Mr. Nathaniel, it seemed would tell whatever he thought people wanted to hear. Sometimes he said he was gonna live out his life in England. Sometimes he said he was gonna live out his life in Cyprus. He was a people pleaser. So what the court looks at is, is really the hard evidence. And I put a couple of other authorities there, um, put, well, they're not authorities, they're first instance decisions, Proles and Colley and Henkes and, and Revenue, um, which are other examples really of the, of, of the court criticizing um, reliance on, or, or choosing not to rely on the assertions of interested parties. Another source for putting together your case is, is this manual, the Residence, Domicile and Remittance Basis Manual. Now it's a, it's a manual from the revenue, 
but it's not specifically of use in, in a tax case. It has a long list of documents which, uh, well, for the revenue, it's for them to decide whether or not a person is, is domiciled over here, um, and, and a long list of sort of questions and additional considerations. I, I'd suggest that it's worth getting uh, that uh, and sending it um, to your clients before you have a meeting with them. Because otherwise they will just come and they will tell you about their citizenship applications and their tax returns and their property purchases. But if they have that, they will come to you with useful information for you to be able to construct your case and to be able to advise them about where they were domiciled. Um, I've just put a couple, a couple of the things there. List, uh, put together a list of the places where the person has resided up until the relevant date. So in the private client context, that'll often be um, when the person died, but it might be their tax application or whatever. Um, explain why they were in this place. You know, so Colonel Whitney was in France because he'd been kicked, chased out of England by his creditors. Um, another person might be in a country because they're an asylum seeker or because they're being detained somewhere. Um, then look at their membership, political parties, lobbying, clubs, societies, but not merely joining because of course anyone who happens to be aware of this might just happen to join a few clubs and societies. You need to really look at what they've done, what the level of their involvement was. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm looking at or thinking about the type of evidence that, that wins these cases, I think about Irvin and Irvin in 2001, which was another divorce case. Now, Mr. Irvin was an American, but he'd acquired a, an English domicile of choice before going to The Hague and spending 20 years at the Hague, in, in, in The Hague, in, in Holland. Um, now, the court took into account the fact that he didn't read a Dutch newspaper, he read The Guardian. He didn't watch Dutch TV, he watched English TV. Perhaps more importantly, he'd never bothered to learn Dutch. If he went shopping, he didn't know enough Dutch to be able to buy his groceries. But it was the, it's the TV and the newspaper that stick with me. And that is the level of detail that you need to get into with your clients. We're going to move on now to jurisdiction. What is often referred to as forum non-convenience, and that's what you'll see in the textbooks if you're, if you're looking up. That's, that's what it'll be in the index. We're mainly going to talk about the case of Raymond and Hamid last year, um, but it's worth mentioning Spiliada, because Spiliada is really the, the starting point for a jurisdiction dispute of this nature. And Lord Goff explained that, in my opinion, the burden of resting, uh, sorry, in my opinion, the burden resting on the defendant is not just to show that England is the natural or appropriate forum for the trial, but to establish that there is another available forum which is clearly or distinctly more appropriate. So that's the threshold that you're looking for, clearly or distinctly more appropriate. Now, in Raymond and Hamid, it concerned Mrs. Ali. Mrs. Ali was born in pre-partition India. She was born in the city of Lahore, and when she was five years old, the city of Lahore became Pakistan. Um, so there was an argument in, uh, in Raymond and Hamid, well, not much of an argument by the other side, but an argument as to what the domicile of origin was. Um, we were saying that her domicile of origin was Pakistan because it would be artificial. Um, to consider somebody's domicile as having changed when nothing about their life and their society changed other than the name of the land in which they lived. And the master accepted that. Uh, and another member of Chambers, um, Hugh Cumber, has dug up uh, an Indian authority which says the same thing. But I would say that that point is probably up for grabs if anyone um, has a similar sort of situation. So, domicile of origin, Pakistan. Now, in 1965, she married uh, Mr. Ali and they moved to London. And they were in London until he died in 2015. Within three months of him dying, uh, she had moved back to Lahore and she was living with a relative in Lahore. Now, this was a wills case because Mr. and Mrs. Ali in the 90s had prepared mirror wills, leaving everything about equally between their two families. But after she went to Pakistan in 2015, she prepared a new will. So in November 2017, Mrs. Ali executed a will leaving everything to the eldest son of the man she was living with. Who was, so that's her great nephew. Now within three weeks, she was dead. In July 2018, 14 of the beneficiaries of the earlier will had commenced probate proceedings um, in Pakistan. And they had named as the defendants, the beneficiary, the sole beneficiary, the great nephew, his father, 
and the executor of the uh, 2017 will. So that was July 2018. In January 2019, the executor started a curious sort of action in the English Family Division, which was essentially a probate claim, um, seeking to propound this will. Essentially the same, raising the same issues, precisely the same issues as those uh, that were being fought out in Pakistan. Um, he only named one defendant, one of the 14 beneficiaries who was uh, on the other side in the case in Pakistan. Now that beneficiary, represented by me, uh, applied uh, to either have, have the English proceedings struck out on the basis that procedurally they were an absolute car crash, or in the alternative, to have it um, transferred to the Chancery Division because it was a probate claim, and stayed on the basis that um, there were proceedings on foot in Pakistan and they should be resolved first. Now it came before Master Schumann, um, and she considered the Spiliardo test in relation to the stay. She declined to strike it out because well, she allowed them to correct a sufficient number of their mistakes. Um, so she was considering which was clearly, uh, whether or not Pakistan was clearly and distinctly uh, the more convenient forum. Now, <clears throat> there was only scope to do this because it fitted into the exception of the uh, recast uh, Brussels regulation. So there's an exception if the, if the proceedings if there are proceedings that have been commenced outside the EU um, first. So it's worth having that in mind before you embark on one of these, um, you know, check, check whether or not you're within the, the, uh, the recast regulation. So the will, the disputed will was in Pakistan. The draftsman of the will was in Pakistan. Anybody who had the uh, motive and opportunity to unduly influence um, Mrs. Ali causing the preparation of this was in Pakistan. The medics who had seen her in the last three years, two or three years of her life, were in Pakistan. Almost all of the beneficiaries of both wills were in Pakistan, save for three, the defendant in England and his brother and sister. Both or all of them wanted it heard in Pakistan. So you can see this, well, clearly and distinctly, Pakistan was the appropriate forum. The, uh, the executive's representatives did sort of uh, battle on as hard as they could, um, arguing otherwise. They said, well, everybody could be flown over. Um, quite a lot of these people are quite used to air travel. Not the most compelling arguments, you might think. But they ran an alternative argument, and their alternative was much more ambitious. If we go back to Lord Goff and Spiliada, he said, if the court concludes at that stage that there is some other available forum which prima facie is clearly more appropriate, it will ordinarily grant a stay unless there are circumstances by reason of which justice requires that a stay should nevertheless not be granted. In this inquiry, the court will consider all circumstances of the case. One such factor can be the fact, if established objectively by cogent evidence, that the plaintiff will not obtain justice in the foreign jurisdiction. So what Mr. Raymond sought rather gamely to do was to denigrate the entire judiciary of Pakistan. The way in which he sought to do that was by filing a, a witness statement um, prepared by his lawyer in Pakistan, a man who appears uh, every day in the courts um, of Pakistan. Um, the master described it in this way, it was a blistering attack on the Pakistani judiciary. She said the manner in which Mr Rajput made his assertions as a lawyer are astonishing. He asserts that Pakistani judges lack expertise and make irrational orders and do not apply the relevant law. Now this wasn't filed by way of an expert um, opinion as to foreign law or as to the operation of a, of a, of a foreign um, court system. Um, this was evidence of fact by an extremely um, partisan witness and it was in my opinion quite rightly um, given virtually no weight. As the master said the allegations made are scurrilous and I simply disregard his evidence. So really that did for uh, Mr Raymond's um, resistance to the application. But the master uh, reminded herself of what is perhaps a slightly more famous um, or perhaps more useful uh, for a non-convenience 
um, case last year, which is Vendata and Lungowe, decided by the Supreme Court in 2019. Uh, and the passage that I put in there um, is from Lord Briggs. A particular reason for the requirement to exercise proportionality in jurisdiction disputes of this kind is that in most cases they involve a contest between two competing jurisdictions, in either of which the parties could obtain substantial justice. The exception, an issue whether substantial justice is obtainable in one of the competing jurisdictions, may require a deeper level of scrutiny not least because a conclusion that a foreign jurisdiction would not provide substantial justice risks offending international comity. Such a finding requires cogent evidence, which may properly be subjected to anxious scrutiny. Now, I take that to be an indication that um, if a party is seeking to denigrate uh, the judiciary of another country, um, then uh, the ordinary considerations of proportionality uh, in relation to foreign non convictions argument do not apply or do not apply with quite the same strength. Now Raymond and Hamid is, is really uh, it, it's a useful example of how of how these sort of jurisdiction disputes um, apply in the private client context um, but it was also relatively unique. Now we are rather over time so I propose um, to stop there I think the only other thing that I was going to talk about was um, in the domicile context, <clears throat> the question of whether or not it is uh, more difficult to establish that a person has uh, acquired a domicile of choice if they are moving from their domicile of origin um, to uh, a domicile of choice rather than moving from one domicile of choice to another domicile of choice. Now, the, the case that I mentioned, the tax case, Henke's, it's only a first instance decision. Um, and it seems to reach the conclusion that it is, uh, it seems to suggest that it is not more difficult to establish a change um, from a domicile of origin. Now, my view is that that is not consistent with House of Lords or authority, but the support for it is in Barlow, Clowes and Henwood. So we don't really have the scope for a, a debate about it using this medium. But if anyone wants to phone me up and argue about it or uh, just discuss it more generally or send me an email about it, then do so. My phone number's there, um, the email address is on the screen as well. And that is the end of the